I'm back in the lab with casts of Homo habilis. These are all cast materials from largely Kenya and Tanzania. Uh, with, we'll talk a little bit about specimens from South Africa also. Homo habilis represents a time span that starts around two million years ago and extends up until around one and a half million years ago. In that time span, it overlaps with other kinds of early hominins, including the robust Australopithecines, Australopithecus boisei and Australopithecus robustus, and the early members of Homo erectus. Homo habilis is distinct from these species in, in a number of ways. And so to figure this out, let's look at a Homo habilis skull and compare it to a human skull and point out the major differences. This is the skull ER1470. It's from the east side of Lake Turkana at a site called Kubifora, and this skull is just around two million years old. It's one of the earliest good specimens of Homo habilis. If you look at this skull in comparison to a human skull, some differences will be immediately apparent. A human skull is vastly bigger than this skull of Homo habilis. However, when we look at the way that the skulls are arranged, the way that the brain of a human forms a globular structure with a face that's just in front and underneath of it, without a huge projection around it, without uh, very large jaw muscles attaching to the sides of this skull, this skull of Homo habilis is similar to that. And in particular, when we look at the face, it's relatively vertical. When we look at the brain case, that brain case is rounded. It doesn't have a really distinctive brow ridge. It is, in some respects, a human looking skull. If we compare this skull to the skull of a chimpanzee, we'll see that these really contrast with each other. The Homo habilis skull is larger. It's got a bigger brain. Its face is more vertical. It doesn't have large canine teeth protruding out from it. And unlike the chimpanzee, which has a very flattened area here in the bridge of the nose, Homo habilis has a slight projection of the bridge of the nose. Those are characteristics that make it different from chimpanzees. They also make it different from early, other early hominins. If we take the most famous skull of Australopithecus africanus, that's the skull from Sturkfontein, STS-5, and compare that to ER-1470, we'll see that they contrast with each other in similar ways. STS-5, like the chimpanzee, has a sloping face, it has a flat area above the nose, and it has a relatively smaller brain. Homo habilis stands apart from earlier hominins and from other kinds of primates in having a relatively large brain. And yet when we look at Homo habilis in comparison to earlier hominins, it's similar to them in lots of ways that it's different from living humans. Living humans are relatively much larger in body size than any Australopithecine. Homo habilis is the same body size as far as we can tell from its postcranial remains. We have a few bones that look like they're probably associated with habilis. They're not like the remains of Australopithecus robustus, but they're much smaller in body size than human remains. There's one skeleton from Olduvai Gorge, OH62, which has an associated upper jaw, which is a habilis-like upper jaw, and a postcranial skeleton, which is small, like the skeleton of Australopithecus afarensis, and Australopithecine-like in its proportions. So when we look at Homo habilis, we're looking at a species that has, in common with earlier hominins, body size. Different from earlier hominins, bigger brains. An additional difference is in the teeth. If we take a skull of Homo habilis like this one, this is ER 1813. This is also from the east side of Lake Turkana. And this skull is around about 1.6 million years old. If we take this skull and look at its teeth, we'll discover that in contrast to many kinds of early hominins, its molar teeth and its premolar teeth are not expanded. They're relatively human-like in their size. Now, understand that since Homo habilis is much smaller than humans in body size, these teeth, even though they're, they're sort of human-like in their size, compare that to a human jaw, 
they're only just a little bit bigger than human teeth. Nevertheless, because this is a much smaller creature, those teeth are relatively large. That tooth size reflects a difference in diet compared to earlier hominids. And that difference in diet probably reflects an increasing reliance on higher energy foods. And one of the interesting things about Homo habilis, the first specimen that was found and named Homo habilis by Phil Tobias, that skull found at Olduvai Gorge, OH7, it consists of two parietal bones, which are relatively large compared to Australopithecine parietal bones, a lower jaw, which has that smaller tooth size and more human-like tooth proportion than any robust Australopithecine, and part of a hand skeleton. And the hand skeleton has fingertips that have a broader surface, a broader surface that's adapted to gripping onto things powerfully through the fingertips. That adaptation, an adaptation probably to stone tool manufacture, is one that marks Homo habilis. However, as we've seen, it also marks another species, Australopithecus sediba. And when we look at the new fossil record emerging from South Africa with Australopithecus sediba and its Australopithecus-like body size, its Australopithecus-like brain size, but a more human-like dental morphology, Homo habilis is similar to that in some ways and different in other ways. We're looking at two million years ago at different ways of being human-like in an Australopithecine-like body size. That suggests that when we look at the East African record of Homo habilis, we should be really be paying attention to the variability among these East African specimens. And no two skulls demonstrate that variability as clearly as ER 1470 and ER 1813. Now, many anthropologists view these skulls as a male and female of the same kind of thing. But other anthropologists view the differences between these as indicative that they belong to different species. After all, the brain size in ER 1470 is around 770 cubic centimeters. The brain size here is around 500 cubic centimeters. They're a big difference. Now that difference is not outside the range of differences that we see among living humans that are, that are divergent in brain size and skull size, but it's fairly extreme. When we look at their dentitions, now ER 1470 doesn't have teeth, but a recently found very similar maxilla, ER 62000, has its teeth, and those teeth are quite large relative to the teeth of this ER1813 skull. And the faces are fairly different. ER1813, even though it's a small skull, has a clearer brow ridge across above the orbits than ER1470 does. They look like they're human-like in slightly different patterns. Now those differences could be due to the fact that they're 300,000 years apart. Or it could be due to the fact that that 300,000 year difference is actually one that's reflecting different kinds of habilines, as we would call them, in different times and places in East Africa. Now we have a fossil record of these Homo habilis or habiline skulls and mandibles that's fairly extensive, especially compared to some of the earlier hominin species where we have one or two specimens. And when we look at them, we observe that they're pretty variable compared to living humans. Not only those differences between larger and smaller, but even within the smaller form. Here, this OH24 skull from Olduvai Gorge and ER1813 from Lake Turkana, those skulls are pretty different in shape. Those differences may reflect geographic variation in one species that's widespread over space. Or they may reflect slightly different adaptations that are emerging in different small-bodied forms of early Homo. Now what's the big idea with Homo habilis? Its hands, its larger brains, its smaller teeth, they're all pointing to a more human-like adaptation than is present in any Australopithecine. And their time range from two million years on up to around one and a half million years that time range is a critical one in human evolution. It's just at the origin of the genus Homo and then extending alongside the earliest specimens of Homo erectus. When we look at Homo habilis, 
we're looking at the possibility that the origin of our genus, the genus Homo, was not a singular event that led to one evolving lineage, but an adaptive radiation that led to different forms doing slightly different things and having very different body sizes. What keeps us from concluding in a straightforward way that we're looking at this diversity of species is that the fossil record shows that there's different things in different places. And as long as that's true, it's possible that we're looking at an evolutionary trajectory across time of smaller brain, smaller bodied homo to larger brained, larger bodied homo. To settle that question, we're going to have to look closely at the fossil record of early Homo erectus.